You are listening to Untitled Theater Company number 61's adaptation of Jack London's The Iron Heel, a three-part audio drama recorded remotely. I am Edward Einhorn, the writer and director. Please continue listening after the episode as I talk with historian Dr. Eric Loomis about the labor movement in the early 20th century. If you enjoy our program, please contribute by texting Iron Heel with no spaces to 44321 and follow the link. Or visit our website, UntitledTheater.com. You can also find information there about the script to the stage play version of this drama. This episode is part one, Romance. My dear comrades, welcome to the Reenactment Archive, an audio archive of historical reenactments of the moments that led to today's Brotherhood of Man. I am Antonia Meredith, an historian and propagandist, and I and my acting collective will be bringing to life a recently uncovered story found in a journal almost 700 years old. It is a time that you may know as the era of the oligarchy, also commonly called the Iron Heel. The journal was found in historic San Francisco on the western edge of what was once known as the United States of America. I am still amazed that it was more or less intact. It was found in an old oak tree, wasn't it? Yes. It it somehow managed to survive centuries of fires and flooding. This is Jack London, a young writer and actor. I asked him to help me dramatize the journal. And he also has chosen to take on the role of Ernest, a young revolutionary at the heart of our story. I felt a sort of connection with them. Let me also introduce the Warblies, a group of spirited musicians who will be chiming in now and again with some ancient folk music, like the music you heard at the beginning of our show. Well done, Warblies. (laughs) Our pleasure. An interesting fact about the term the Iron Heel, which we just recently discovered, it was actually coined by Ernest Everhart, Jack's character. He was the hero of the revolution. He was one of many heroes, I should point out. No one man can change history alone. But heretofore, his story was unknown, and that is just the beginning of what we have learned. This journal, written by Ernest's wife, Avis, is truly an amazing document. Her words have filled in blanks that have puzzled historians like me for centuries. Let us listen to some of the words that begin her diary. It is so quiet and peaceful that I sit here and ponder and am restless. It is the quiet that makes me restless. It seems unreal. All the world is quiet, but it's the quiet before the storm. I strain my ears and all of my senses for some betrayal of that impending storm. And as I listen, it comes. The wind. So Avis wrote, waiting upon the revolt of 1932, what some call the Second Revolt. It was to be brutal. The tortuous and distorted revolution of the next three centuries would compel the revolt of 1953, the revolt of 1981, the revolt of 2021, and many more revolts all drowned in seas of blood ere the world movement of labor should come into its own. I am lonely. I do not think of what is to come. I think of what has been and what is no more. My equal... My earnest, beating with tireless wings the void, soaring towards what was ever his son, the flaming ideal of human freedom. I cannot sit idly by and await the great event that is his making. Oh, he is not here to see. He devoted all of the years of his manhood to it, and for it he gave his life. It is his handiwork. He made it. Mm, With all respect to Avis Everhart, it must be pointed out once more that Ernest was but one of many able leaders of the revolution. Avis's story begins in February 1912, 
and the date traditionally given to the start of the Iron Heel is 1913. But it is difficult to trace the oligarchy to a single moment. As usual, it was an accumulation of growing historical forces. Let me remind you, in the early 20th century, capitalism was adjudged to be the culmination of bourgeois rule, the ripened fruit of the bourgeois revolution. We of today can but applaud that judgment. Following upon capitalism, it was expected that socialism would emerge. Out of the decay of self-seeking capitalism would arise that flower of the ages. In other words, our current brotherhood of man. What they did not realize was that the journey would be so treacherous. I shall try to write simply and to tell here how Ernest Everhard entered my life, how he grew until I became a part of him and the tremendous changes he wrought in my life. In this way, may you look at him through my eyes and learn him as I learned him. And all, save the things too secret and sweet for me to tell. It was in February 1912 that I first met him, when he appeared at a party in my father's house in Berkeley. Avis, (laughs) that dress looks lovely on you. John Cunningham, Avis Everhart's father, was a physics professor at the State University at Berkeley, California. Thank you, Father, but it must have been so expensive. (sighs) Nonsense. It's been a good year. And what else would I spend it on? You never buy anything for yourself. I have all I need. Excuse me for a moment. I see Dr. Hammerfeld has arrived. I must say hello. I will bring him over and introduce him, shall I? Uh, Of course, if you like. Ernest Everhard. Oh, (laughs) you startled me, Mr. Everhard. Uh, I didn't see you approach. Uh, A pleasure to meet you. Are you a prize fighter? Prize fighter? Why would you think that? It was the custom of men in those days to compete for purses of money in contests of hand-to-hand combat. When one was beaten into insensibility or killed, the survivor took the money. You have the look of one. And your hands. What about them? I've not felt a hand so rough. I am a working man. Oh. A working man? How intriguing! Avis, this is the Dr. Hammerfeld I just mentioned. Apologies, I could not help but overhear. Uh, Perhaps this young man could weigh in on a discussion I was just having with Bishop Morehouse. We were wondering if the church does enough to aid the working class. Mm -hmm. I am not schooled in such things. Oh, go on. We respect the opinion of any man if it is Mm -hmm. sincere. All right, then. If you truly want to hear my opinion... It is this, that you all know nothing, and worse than nothing, oh. about the working class. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, my dear boy, you may not realize it, but my doctorate is in sociology. I'm sorry, but your sociology is both vicious and worthless. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you find so vicious and worthless, young man? You are metaphysicians. You can prove anything by metaphysics. Hmm? And having done so, every metaphysician can prove every other metaphysician wrong to his own satisfaction. You are anarchists in the realm of thought. And you are mad cosmos makers. Each of you dwells in a cosmos of his own making, created out of his own fancies and desires. You do not know the real world in which you live, and your thinking has no place in the real world, except insofar as it is a phenomenon of mental aberration. Oh, (laughs) what would you have us be instead? Scientists. What good, what tangible good have metaphysicians wrought for mankind? Hmm? They philosophized about the heart as the seat of the emotions while the scientists were formulating the circulation of the blood. They declaimed about famine and pestilence as being scourges of God while the scientists were building granaries and draining cities. They were they were describing the Earth as the center of the universe while the scientists were discovering America and probing space for the stars and the laws of the stars. In That's- short, the metaphysicians have done nothing, absolutely nothing for mankind. Step by step before the advance of science, they have been driven back. Yet, the thought of Aristotle ruled Europe For 12 centuries, and Aristotle was a metaphysician. 
You refer to a very dark period in human history, a period wherein science was raped by the metaphysicians, wherein oh, physics yes. became a search yes. for the philosopher's stone, wherein chemistry became alchemy, and astronomy became astrology. Sorry, the domination of Aristotle's thought. Who are you to say that sociology is not a science? How can it be? You avow your knowledge of the working class, but it is clear you know nothing of it. You do not live in That's the same not. locality with the working class. Hmm? Well, you herd with the capitalist class in another locality. And why not? It is the capitalist class that pays you, that feeds you, that, that puts the very clothes on your backs that you are wearing tonight. Just and in return... I you preach to your employers the brands of metaphysics that are especially acceptable to them. And the especially acceptable brands are acceptable because they do not menace the established order of society. I can assure you, we in the church are quite sincere in our desire to help. Indeed, I have listened to Bishop Morehouse here give many a sermon about the need for us to raise the living conditions of the less fortunate. No, I am not challenging your sincerity. You are sincere. You preach what you believe. There lies your strength and your value to the capitalist class. But should you change your belief to something that menaces the established order, your preaching would be unacceptable to your employers and you would be discharged. Oh, that's... Excuse me if I ask, but how was it that you came to be invited to this party? I wasn't. I saw the food and drink and I was hungry. <laughs> so I came in and ate. Then you are no more than a common thief. Well, you clearly have more food than you can eat yourselves. Would I be less of a thief if I waited for your scraps of the garbage so I could partake of them then? <laughs> you introduced yourself to me as if you were a guest. You're a lovely young woman. Why shouldn't I introduce myself? Uh, eat the food and welcome. At least we can say in that way we have helped the problem of the working class. <laughs> no, oh, yes. <laughs> no, that's very good. <laughs> no, Bishop, you can say that in that way, I helped myself. <laughs> the rest of Avis's account of that evening mostly concerns her romantic reactions to her future husband. She calls him, unlike men of my own class, so alien and so strong, and so forth. After that evening, Ernest became a frequent visitor to her father's house. To Avis's surprise, her father welcomed the young man. Her father was particularly taken by some of the songs Ernest shared, songs of the workers at the Sierra Mill and across America. Here is one that has survived to our day, Hard Times at the Mill. Every morning at half past four, you hear the cooks hop on the floor. It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Every morning right at six, don't that old bell make you sick? It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Pulley got hot, the bell jumped off. Mr. Guy and Derby off. It's hard times in the mill, my love. Hard times in the mill. Section hands, he thinks is a man. He ain't got sense to pay off his hands. It's hard times in the mill, my love. Hard times in the mill. And every night when I go home, a piece of cornbread and an old jawbone. It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Ain't it enough to break your heart, have to work all day and at night it's dark. It's hard times in the mill, my love. It's hard. Mr. Everhard, I've been waiting for you. Will you sit with me in our garden for a moment? Uh, the benches have dried from this morning's rain. What would you like? What would you like to discuss? I've been reading these pamphlets you've written. Working class philosophy, philosophy and revolution. What is their purpose? They are propaganda. What else? 
propaganda. No revolution has ever been successful without effective propaganda. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, Christianity. We must recognize that and use it to our advantage. Those songs your father loves so much, they are changing minds and changing hearts. I hope my pamphlets can do the same. Then I have a quarrel with you. You foment class hatred. I consider it wrong and criminal to appeal to all that is narrow and brutal in the working class. Class hatred is antisocial, and it seems to me antisocialistic. There's, there's no mention of class hatred. Uh, in your pamphlets, you call it class struggle. Well, that is a different thing. Class struggle is a law of social development. We are not responsible for it. We do not make the class struggle. We merely explain it, as Newton explained gravitation. We explain the nature of the conflict of interest that produces the class struggle, the conflict of interest between labor and capital. But why should there be a conflict of interest? Indeed, why should there be? Perhaps it is because we are so made. Would you agree that the average man is selfish? Perhaps, but he ought not to be. He ought not to be selfish, but he will continue to be selfish as long as he lives in a social system that is based on pig ethics. Pig ethics? Laissez-faire, the let-alone policy of each for himself and devil take the hindmost. The wild Indian is not so brutal and savage as the capitalist class. You do not know us. We are not brutal and savage. Prove it. How can I prove it to you? Prove it to yourself. I know it. I understand you have money, or your father has, which is the same thing, invested in Sierra Mills. What has that to do with anything? Nothing much, except that the gown you wear is stained with blood. The food you eat is a bloody stew. Listen. You hear that sound? That drip, drop, drip, drop? It is just the remnant of the rain. No, it is the sound of the blood of little children and strong men dripping from your very roof. One needs money to live. Is not your money stained with blood? Where does it come from? Mine came from labor at first and then from my colleagues, the socialists. We support each other when in need, and we don't need much. I will introduce you to them one day, soon, I think. Wait, do you see that man out on the sidewalk carrying his wares upon his back? He is a local peddler. Does he pass here often? I've seen him before. With that strong body of his, he should be at work and not peddling. That man's name is Jackson. You know him? I worked with him. Notice the sleeve of his left arm. Oh, he has an arm missing. Some of the blood from that arm that I heard dripping from your roof. He lost his arm in the Sierra Mills. And like a broken down horse, you turned him out on the highway to die. And when I say you, I mean the superintendent and the officials that you and the other stockholders pay to manage the mills for you. It was an accident. It was caused by his trying to save the company a few dollars. The toothed drum of the picker caught his arm. He might have let the small flint that he saw in the teeth go through would have smashed out a double row of spikes, but he reached for the flint, and his arm was picked and clawed to shreds from the fingertips to the shoulder. It was at night. The mills were working overtime. They paid a fat dividend that quarter. Jackson had been working many hours, and his muscles had lost their resiliency and snap. They made his movements a bit slow. That was why the machine caught him. And what did the company do for him? Nothing. Oh, yes, they did do something. They successfully fought the damage suit he brought when he came out of hospital. The company employs very efficient lawyers, you know. You have not told the whole story. <laughs> or else you do not know the whole story. Maybe that man was insolent. <laughs> insolent? <laughs> Great God. Insolent, with his arm chewed off. Nevertheless, he was a meek and lowly servant, and there is no record of his having been insolent. But the courts. The case would not have been decided against him had there been no more to the affair than you've mentioned. Colonel Ingram is leading counsel for the company. 
He's a shrewd lawyer. I tell you what you do, Miss Cunningham. You investigate Jackson's case. I intend to. Tell you where to find him. That I tremble for you when I think of all you are about to prove by Jackson's arm. It is hard for us to imagine the dwelling of a man such as Jackson today. He lived out near the marsh. Pools of stagnant water stood around his house, their surfaces covered with a green and putrid-looking scum, while the stench that arose from them was intolerable. For this privilege, he paid rent, enormous rent, to his landlords. They might have given me a job as a watchman, anyway. How did you happen to get your arm caught in the machine? I don't know. Just happened. Carelessness? No, I ain't for calling it that. I was working overtime, and I guess I was tired out some. I worked 17 years in them mills, and I've took notice that most of the accidents happens just before whistle blow. The laborers of the time were called to work and dismissed by savage, screaming, nerve-wracking steam whistles. I'm willing to bet that more accidents happens in the hour before whistle blow than in all the rest of the day. A man ain't so quick after working steady for hours. I've seen too many of them cut up and gouged and chawed not to know. Many of them? Hundreds and hundreds. And children, too. Did you violate some sort of safety rule? No, ma'am. I chucked off the belt with my right hand and made a reach for the flint with my left. I didn't stop to see if the belt was off. I thought my right hand had done it. Only it didn't. I reached quick and the belt wasn't all the way off. Then my arm was chawed off. It must have been painful. The crunching of the bones wasn't nice. And your lawsuit? I don't rightfully know. Someone said something that wasn't what it ought to have been, I guess. So now I peddle. And my eldest, he works in the mill. But aren't you afraid he might have an accident? I don't see that we have much choice if we want to eat. You might have given me a job as a watchman anyway. In those days, enormous numbers of men were employed as watchmen to protect property. Thievery was incredibly prevalent. The lords of society stole legally or else legalized their stealing, while the poorer classes stole illegally. Nothing was safe unless guarded. Jackson marked just the beginning of my journey. Through him, I met another man whose leg had been destroyed when a machine had fallen on it. Through him, the widow of a man who had been struck in the head. Through her, three others. None had been compensated by the mill. Some had resorted to the law, and some, seeing it as a futile gesture, had not bothered. Colonel Ingram, the company lawyer, had a reputation for never losing a case. A few days after I had met Jackson, I saw Colonel Ingram at a church reception and decided to confront him. My dear... What can it be that you need to speak about with such urgency? It is about a man named Jackson, a worker injured at the mill. Do you know him? I do. And you were the lawyer that represented the mill against him? I was. Do you think that he should have received damages? I think his case was a tragedy. Yes, but do you think he received what he deserved? I think he deserves as much as can be given to him, but that has nothing to do with the law. Do you think that you had moral right on your side? Legal right. By which you mean might? Some call it that. Then how are we supposed to get justice by means of the law? Justice is the only thing the law provides. That is the paradox. Is this your personal feeling? I am speaking as one whose profession is the law. But what are your personal feelings, your feelings as a spiritual man? I'm so sorry, my dear. You wish me to speak against my employers. You must understand I cannot, if you will excuse me. At that same function, I spotted Mrs. Wixon, the wife of one of the mill owners. She had a reputation for contributing to charity, or at least I had heard her speak of doing so on many occasions. So I decided to appeal to her charitable side. Mrs. Wixon was what was called at the time a society woman. In the minds of the wealthy, the only people who participated in society were the idle rich, not the common laborers. Mrs. Wixon, is there any way that you can help this poor man? 
Avis, you must understand. To give him money would be to reward him for his carelessness. But his situation is desperate. Even if he was careless in his exhaustion, doesn't the mill have an obligation to take care of its workers? Indeed we do. And it is for that very reason that I refuse. Think, by paying him, I would tempt others to hurt themselves similarly. Who would voluntarily put themselves through that horror? You are young and sheltered, Avis, and I do not think you understand the mind of the working class. That evening, Ernest came to call again. He found me in a dismal mood. So did you speak with Jackson? I did. And? I... I think some of his blood is dripping from our roof. Of course, if Jackson and his fellows were treated mercifully, the dividends that your father receives would not be as large. I shall never be able to take pleasure in pretty gowns again. But when we are married, you will delight in other things. (laughs) Are we to be married? Of course. I thought that was assumed. Ernest, you're so articulate when you speak about the plight of the working class. Indeed, I can hardly pause you when it comes to politics. But when it comes to love, you haven't said a word. Haven't you assumed it is our fate as well? Perhaps. But you have not so much as kissed me. There. We are engaged. (laughs) It was a nice kiss. Do you have a priest hidden behind the door to finish the matter? Must we have a priest? Well, we must have the Bishop Morehouse, but why are we discussing this? No, No date has been set. What date would you prefer? We should talk to my father about it first. Mm, Very well. Where is he? Now? Why not? He's at a meeting at the Philomaths Club. They're assembling at Bishop Morehouse's cathedral tonight. Very well. Let's join him. Ernest, we haven't been invited. If I waited to be invited, I would never be admitted anywhere. And we should never have met. Besides, doesn't a church have the obligation to welcome all comers? I suppose that's true. Then let us go to see your father. Well, that's a nice romantic note to end on before a break, don't you think? Ernest was a little awkward, but he got there in the end. Oh, is it break time already? Hmm. I was hoping to get to the next scene. Some good stuff there. I think our listeners can wait. I have to admit, I'm starving. And those singers have some food they offered to share. It's just some simple bread and cheese, but we'd love it if you could join us. I didn't know we were having a meal break. Sure, I'll have some. Good, then it's settled. (laughs) We'll put the recording on pause, and when we come back, we'll do the bit where you finally meet Wixen, the owner of the mill. And begin my political career. Yes, indeed. Would you like some wine? I would love some. Uh, whiskey for me, if you have it. I think we have a little somewhere. Excellent. Until the next recording, thank you for listening to The Iron Heel, part of the reenactment archive. Join us again soon. That ends episode one. Thank you for listening. I'd like to share with you now an excerpt from my interview with Dr. Eric Loomis. The full interview will be released separately at a later date. Please remember to leave a review and rating if you enjoyed this episode. Uh, Hello, I am Edward Einhorn, the writer and director of this adaptation of The Iron Heel, and... I will be talking with Eric Loomis about the history of labor, especially around 1908 when Jack London originally wrote the novel. Eric Loomis is Associate Professor of History at the University of Rhode Island. He's the author of three books, Out of Sight, The Long and Disturbing Story of Corporations, Outsourcing Catastrophe, written in 2015, Empire of Timber, Labor Unions in the Pacific Northwest Forest in 2016, and A History of America in Ten Strikes, which was written in 2018. Thank you so much for joining us. You bet. Glad to be here. Just want to start with a little bit about you. If you could just tell uh, us a little bit about your work on labor history and how you got involved in that area. Uh, Sure. So, uh, you know, I'm a labor historian. I am uh, interested in particularly 
in sort of educational sort of enterprises that popularize labor history and create narratives for the public in ways that move beyond simple romanticizing of the past labor movement, but to really understand its complexities in order that we create a better labor movement today. My own personal interest uh, is a combination of things. You know, I was in graduate school many years ago at the University of Tennessee. I was involved in organizing a union there and other other campaigns like that. And, you know, I also grew up in the Pacific Northwest in the 1980s and early 90s when there was a lot of battles uh, between environmentalists and the labor movement over spotted owl protection and other environmental protections. And so as a scholar, I work on trying to uh, find ways to bridge uh, the differences between the environmental and labor movement. But I'm also, of course, uh, again, interested in these broader kind of discussions of labor as well, again, in order that we can really learn from the past and understand the structural issues that have gotten in the way of real uh, left-leaning democracy in this country uh, to try to move that conversation forward a little bit. So as you know, Jack London is a socialist, and a lot of the book deals with socialism as well as labor. Could you just uh, sort of distinguish for us the labor movement of the early 20th century versus the socialist movement of the time? Well, sure. I mean, the labor movement is tremendously complicated in, in, say, the early 20th century. I mean, there were a lot of socialists who were in the labor movement, but there were a lot of anti-socialists in the labor movement as well. You know, this is a time period in which Americans are really finally coming to grips with the reality of industrial capitalism. So if you look at the late 19th century, for instance, there's a lot of kind of one-off ideas about how to fix industrial capitalism that don't really challenge the overall system. Uh, some of these include the writings of Edward Bellamy, uh, which was tremendously popular at the time, the single tax of Henry George, Chinese exclusion, the eight-hour day, uh, et cetera. There was just a number of ideas that basically started at the position that if we just fix this one thing, capitalism will, will work. And this is very popular with large swaths of the American working class, especially native-born whites. And, uh, you know, socialism um, is, is, you know, a series of ideologies that's not really just one thing, but was a, a whole sort of constellation of ideas, uh, many of which are imported from Europe and come to the United States through immigrants, uh, through German immigrants that are fleeing political repression beginning after the uh, 1848 revolution, but then really picking up in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, as well as Jewish immigrants uh, who are coming over, especially from what is today uh, the Baltic states or Russia, uh, who are involved in the Jewish Bund and uh, who are uh, who are, are really bringing like pretty complicated ideas of a radical change to the American economy into the United States. And you know, and so the you know socialism broadly conceived is a form of government in which in which rather than uh, economic activity being created in in service of private profit, it is created in service of the collective needs of the people. Again, at the time, we're talking 1908, say, when, when London writes The Iron Heel, uh, that, that could mean anarchism, it could mean the IWW's form of syndicalism, it could mean Eugene Debs and that form of socialism, it could be the municipal socialism that a lot of the German immigrants get into, things like, you know, um, collective ownership of, uh, of public utilities, um, that's a relatively moderate form. So it's it's quite complicated, um, both the labor movement and socialism at this time. But fundamentally, right, socialism is demanding public ownership. So socialism is demanding a collective response uh, and collective ownership of resources. And, and a lot of the labor movement, again, particularly the native-born labor movement, might be extremely uncomfortable with those ideas, uh, even as, as late as 1908. And so you will have large sectors of the labor movement that are supporting the Republican Party, for instance, uh, at a time when the Republican Party is, is totally owned by uh, by plutocrats. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there, there's all kinds of historical reasons for that. But the point is, is that, you know, that, that there's the, the working class in this country is, is a, a tremendously complicated and diverse group of individuals. And uh, socialism appealed to some and did not appeal to others. Yeah, and I, I read in your History of American Ten Strikes, the IWW actually expelled uh, some members because they were tying the movement too much to socialism, they felt. Was that, is that true? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a figure in American socialism named Daniel De Leon. And De Leon, basically, he was a tyrant. He kind of wanted to be an American Lenin. 
And he wants to sort of hijack this organization for his own sort of vision of, of socialist change. And I, you know, that made him, other than his relatively small number of allies, uh, incredibly unpopular in a, a movement. You know, the IWW initially springs out of miners in places like Colorado and Idaho, the Western Federation of Miners. And these were fairly independent guys who were not particularly interested in being, you know, the, the the followers of a single movement leader. I mean, the, you know, when we think of the IWW, for instance, you know, the most famous wobbly is Big Bill Haywood, but but Haywood's hardly a Lenin, right? He's not a he's not a dictator issuing party policy. You know, I mean, it's a fairly democratic organization, and it's 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 very decentralized, right? And so the idea of this individual such as De Leon coming in and, and becoming a Lenin-like figure was pretty revolting to a lot of these people. And, and in fact, what it was doing, you know, the IWW's found that in 1905, by 1908, it really hasn't done anything. And that's in part because it's totally torn between, you know, De Leon and, and, and the others. And so it's not really until they kick him out that it becomes an organization that's actually uh, useful in organizing workers. Speaking of the IWW, so uh, just to define terms that Industrial Workers of the World, uh, which are also called the Wobblies, they were based in Chicago, right? And then the book actually goes from West Coast, uh, the San Francisco area where where Jack London is, and ends in Chicago. And my uh, impression, if I'm correct, is that there's also a whole different society, uh, you know, a group of uh, in the labor mo- uh, movement in the East Coast in New York. Could you sort of distinguish regional uh, ideas in terms of and the significance of Chicago in the labor movement at the time? Sure. I mean, the the real critical issue here is is the role of immigration, that that different groups of immigrants are in different areas. And so, you know, in in a place like New York, uh, let's say the socialist part of the labor movement is very heavily uh, Jewish, a lot of women leaders. Uh, you know, a lot of people coming out of the textile industries. Um, you know, Chicago is is more, uh, you know, less Jewish, more Catholic, more Orthodox, you know, less connected to, uh, you know, the Jewish Bund, but also very heavily connected to the German forms of socialism uh, that have developed, uh, uh, you know, that, that were brought over to there. And, and the other thing about Chicago is that, you know, it really by the 1880s becomes uh, kind of the quintessential American city in some ways, the 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 hub uh, connecting the nation from east to west, the hub connecting the movement of natural resources everywhere, the hub in which, you know, the the, the big meat packing, uh, you know, where the, the cows uh, would be transferred from a Texas or a Kansas and put into product in these giant factories in Chicago, and then sent across the nation. And so you've kind of specific sort of labor movement um, that develops around that. And then, you know, on the West Coast, you know, San Francisco is very immigrant heavy as well. But, you know, on the West Coast, uh, you you have a, a kind of a different kind of a labor movement, one that's really based uh, very largely in extractive industry, one that's more rural. And this is where the IWW, for instance, has a lot of success in the timber camps, on the farms and in the mines, the isolated American West. And, uh, you know, these, the, the other part about the American West is that it is more male dominated. I mean, just strictly population wise, uh, most of these relatively isolated, particularly mining and timber uh, communities, uh, don't have a lot of women in them. And so you have a, a very sort of uh, overtly masculine labor movement in much of the West that I think is, is quite appealing to uh, Jack London, who's sort of has a lot of obsessions about gender uh, anyway. Thank you so much. It was really fascinating. Thank you for, for talking to us. This episode was produced by Untitled Theatre Company Number no. 61, A Theatre of Ideas. It's adapted from Jack London's 1908 book, The Iron Heel. It starred Mike Iverson Jr. as Ernest Everhard, Yvonne Rowan as Antonia Meredith, Victoria Rule as Avis Everhard, Craig Anderson as Bishop Morehouse and Jackson, Joshua Wolf Coleman as John Cunningham, Maxwell Zener as Dr. Hammerfeld, Kevin Argus as Ingram, Yvonne Cullinan as Mrs. Wixon, and Yael Haskell as Alana. The War Please are Craig Anderson and John Bronston, Yael Haskell, and Jenny Lee Mitchell. Our songs in today's episode were Solidarity Forever, words by Ralph Kaplan to a traditional Austin camp song of unknown authorship, and Hard Times at the Mill, a traditional song of unknown authorship. Arrangements for the stage version of The Iron Heel were written by Chris Chappell. Arrangements for this audio play were written by Richard Philbin, who also provided all the instrumentals. 
Richard also composed and played our background music. The episode was sound designed and edited by Ian W. Hill. Sound effects are courtesy of the BBC through a Creative Commons license or license from Storyblocks. The play was originally presented as a live stage version across various venues in New York, including Judson Church, Freedom Hall, and South Oxford Space in the summer of 2016. The play is published by Theatre 61 Press at theatre61press.com. Funding for this podcast was made possible in part by grants from the Lower Manhattan Community Council, the Puffin Foundation, and the Shapiro Fund. This podcast was recorded under a sag after collective bargaining agreement. Please visit our website, untitledtheater.com, to learn more about the show and our theater company. You can also donate by texting Iron Heel with no spaces to 44321 and following the link. If you enjoyed this audio drama, please listen to our other audio drama series, The Resistible Rise of J.R. Brinkley. My name is Edward Einhorn, and I am the writer and director. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you can join us for the next episode.